This company shouldn't be allowed within a mile of liquid metal. It's all over the interior of the chassis of their mini pre-built computer. And the best part is that there's not even liquid metal on the CPU. It's just all over everything else. It's on the motherboard, it's on the chassis, it's on the fan. It's perfect for eventually causing a short circuit somewhere. Liquid metal is a fantastic conductor. It's really good at conducting. It's also good at conducting, electricity, that is. And all it takes is one drop of it to lodge itself between the ball grid array of the SOC to blow up the whole system, especially because the part's soldered, so you're never gonna be able to fix it. But that's not even the best part. Mini's forum, which on its website claims that it, quote, provides people with big fun and much convenience and offers unparalleled reliability along with listening to constructive suggestions, actually sent us two units and said that it would have liquid metal between the CPU and the heatsink. And neither one of them did. And by the way, the one that Jay's Two Cents got from Mini's forum also didn't have liquid metal between the CPU and the heatsink. So this is clearly a problem. The systems they sent out to press don't match the marketing, don't match what they even told press. If they can't get it right for us, we have no reason to believe they can get it right for you, for everybody else. Uh, so it was all for marketing. And removing the heatsink proves this simply and easily enough. But considering that it was spattered all over the walls and the interior shell of the chassis, it's probably best they stay off the syringe unless they want to make like remake Terminator with the liquid metal Terminator, in which case it's, it's a great gruesome murder scene for one of those. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new keyboard. EVGA's new Z20 and Z15 RGB optical mechanical gaming keyboards have abundant RGB LEDs and programmable macro keys on the left side of the keyboard. They also have a sensor to detect and turn on the LEDs when you're in front of the keyboard and turn them off when distant, offering a unique feature for keyboards. The keyboard claims a 0.5 millisecond response time and 100 million keystroke lifespan. Learn more at the link in the description below. The worst part of this whole thing is that we actually had a neutral to positive review lined up for the HX90, but the company worked its absolute hardest to slowly chisel it away piece by piece until all that was left was this. The bugbear of incompetence somnambulantly meandering through the most basic requirement of making sure the chief marketing point is actually somewhere in the product. We had filmed everything, but we've scrapped it all because as we got further into the device, we learned it was getting worse and worse. In our first teardown, we discovered liquid metal all over the chassis with dots scattered around the motherboard, as if liquid metal was sprayed out of the rear end of a hippo at the chassis for this case. And that was before we knew it was supposed to have liquid metal. Again, it didn't, at least not under the CPU. I, technically, I guess it had liquid metal, just not how it's normally used. Uh, we stopped though, and we requested another sample. We also asked the company why, as in why is there liquid metal, an electrically conductive material, all over the PCB for this motherboard, waiting to drip into two contacts or pads somewhere. And the company said, oops, and that was pretty much the recap of it. So they sent out a second one. Uh, the company apologized for wasting an enormous amount of our time. This is probably the most time we've ever had wasted by a company on any singular review. It gets worse, we'll get into that. Uh, because we had already spent 40 hours of staff time testing it at this point. Pour one out for Patrick, who unfortunately, Sharpies, but same idea, had to deal with the testing process not once, but twice for this device, and both times we found out that it wasn't as marketed. And the problem is this. With liquid metal, it's not so simple as just taking it apart to verify that it's there. Because once you've done that, all of the testing is going to be basically invalid. We could reapply the liquid metal ourselves. It would be no problem if all we wanted to do was test the thermals. But the application of liquid metal is special. It takes a, an extreme amount of care. It takes a lot of experience to do it right. And that's part of the test. So we need it to be completely assembled, never taken apart before, especially by us where we'll fix their problems, by accident even apparently because they're that bad, we need it to be assembled because otherwise we don't know if their liquid metal application is horrible. All it takes is a microscopic dot, uh, well, either one, to short something, which they're working on, they're trying their best, uh, or two, to have an extreme hot spot on the silicon. So we've done a lot of work with liquid metal in the past and you need to apply it to both sides of 
won the heat sink and the SOC. I imagine that what I'm saying is new information for Minis Forum at this point because I can't trust them uh, to express any level of competence in their products from what we've seen in the past week. So perhaps they're taking notes. But you need to apply it to both sides. I'm sorry if this is repeat information for the rest of you. And it needs to be evenly spread on both surfaces. It shouldn't be a pool of liquid. It should be an extremely thin film on both sides because the surface tension of them will bring them together and form that good bond. If it's not done exactly as I've just described, it will not work. You'll have at least one core at 100 degrees Celsius, while the rest are maybe fine, and you can end up with deltas core to core of upward to 40, 50 degrees. This is obviously terrible and is exactly why it takes a lot of care to apply liquid metal to something. Anyway, all that aside, we were willing to give Minis Form a second chance, and in fact, we did. We didn't get on camera right away and start talking about how much they screwed up the first one because the company expressed its mistakes, apologized, and said it would send a second one, this time with liquid metal, and said, by the way, sorry, we don't know how to use the reply all button and emails, but we've fixed it, our apologies. So we said, okay, we'll start working on testing it. We'll work on the second one, mention it, but it won't be the crux of the review. And then we tested the second one for a week. And then they emailed us after we said, hey, we would encourage you to be honest. Uh, is there liquid metal on this one? Not telling them that the thermals look basically the same. Something seems fishy. And they replied and said yes. And then they replied a few days later and said no. Our bad. Anyway, it's clear at this point that liquid metal should not be on the marketing sheet for this product. Even if they work towards putting it on here properly for consumers, our concern is that it's going to end up killing parts because they're doing it completely carelessly. A liquid metal can be done well, and it's a fantastic tool, especially if used as an end user where you have total control of the process. But we can't trust them to use it. That leaves the rest of the computer, though. If they drop the liquid metal marketing and they don't use it, then perhaps there's something here that's worth buying. It's an overpriced mini ITX box that sort of skirts its way to looking a lot smaller than it is in reality because there's an external power brick, so you've got two things to carry around, uh, and that's why it can look as small as it does. But maybe there's still value there if none of that makes you say, never mind, I actually don't want that. And so we'll look at some of that. Patrick, unfortunately, did generate something like 20 or 22 charts for this originally when we found out that uh, a significant component of the product was missing. And so then he retested it and generated about that many again. And we're going to look at some of them, but we won't be using them all because our end conclusion is very simple uh, and we'll give it to you early, which is that we don't trust Minis Forum at this point to do just about anything competently because they had two chances to do something right and they had many weeks to correct themselves in both instances before we ever got to filming. If they can't do it right for us, we don't think they can do it right for you. This is kind of like, this is, it's kind of the, the main thing for your product is, is making sure the top thing on your page is as advertised and that you don't make it so that it's capable of self-destructing. Oh, <laughs> Actually, it's a feature with some products, but. Enough of that, let's get into some of the thermal tests and at least look at that aspect to see how they did with it with thermal paste. And maybe we'll look at some games, I don't know. It's. We'll look at some charts, and then we'll tell you in the conclusion again not to buy it. Here's the spec sheet. The Minis Form Elite Mini HX90 is a $750 pre-built PC when bare bones, minimally anyway for the price, meaning that you would provide the RAM and the SSD. Pricing goes up to $1,000 for the 32 gigabyte RAM and 512 gigabyte SSD variant. The fact that the company's website says orders from September 1st are already being processed makes us curious as to whether they fixed the liquid metal issue in time for those customers. And if they didn't, you should at least return it because it's false advertising, in the most literal sense, it's that simple. The chassis is mostly easy to disassemble, except for maladroit handling of some points. Minis Forum markets this as user serviceable and upgradable. That's somewhat true. It's a mini ITX form factor board, despite having a soldered CPU and needing a barrel plug for the power, but it's technically somewhat replaceable. It's also sold as a bare bones kit, so clearly they intend for you to install your own SSD and RAM. Unfortunately, they are also using tamper resistant security torque screws, the ones with a little bump in the middle, which companies only use when they want to keep someone out of a device. Sure, Torx itself is arguably better than maybe Philips in some instances, 
but security torques adds actually zero value to the integrity of the screw and only stands to make it one step more annoying to open. This is an odd dichotomy of worlds. The HX90 is based around an AMD R9-5900HX, an 8-core 16-thread laptop APU with 8-core Vega graphics on board. These specs are equivalent to a $360 socketed R7-5700G APU only in the spec sheet, in writing only, but they don't actually match in performance. We'll look at that. Both parts have a listed max of 4.6 gigahertz, but the 5900HX has a base clock of 3.3 gigahertz and a default TDP of 45 watts, which dictates how much power it's pulling when it's boosting. The 5700G has a base clock of 3.8 and a TDP of 65 watts when left default. The unit that was sent to us included 16 gigabytes or two by eight gigabytes of dual channel Kinston 3200 CL22 DDR4 memory and a Kinston 512GB PCIe NVMe SSD. That particular configuration is $830 for a pre-order. And it's more if it's not pre-ordered. Here are some fun quotes from the HX90 product page, just in case the other marketing wasn't enough to sell you on it. Quote, the PC body is made from carbon fiber materials with grain designs on the surface. The main structural parts of the HX90 and the black part of the fuselage are injection molded with carbon fiber composite materials. As a high performance and recyclable new material, wait, wait, wait a minute, new? Anyway, Mini's form continues, carbon fiber is not only rich in texture and delicate in hand, gross, but also very high strength. Uh, have good thermal conductivity and corrosion resistance, which will be your sturdy gaming hardware. I, I don't know which, where, where is it? We can't tell you whether or not plastic technically contains carbon fibers. Maybe you can let us know in the comments, but we can tell you that the woven texture is just molded in and that the patented AVE hot soldering iron test melts a hole right through it. If there is some sort of carbon fiber reinforcing the plastic, it was a waste of money. You'd be better off with dbrand, and at least when they insult you, it's part of the experience. Frequency validation has the CPU core at about 3600 MHz over the course of testing, with a few spikes to 4300 MHz before load ramps. Sustained, this 3.6 GHz number is what limits performance so heavily in applications and in the gaming tests coming up. The first thermal plot quickly looks at horizontal versus vertical orientation. We did this since the vertical stand theoretically could block some of the ventilation, and we wanted to see if it affected it. The end difference was basically zero. We saw maximally a 3% increase in fan RPM when left to auto control, but the thermal difference in auto or manual configurations was negligible. It just didn't matter. The system was generally at about 77 degrees Celsius for CPU temperature or 64 for GPU, assuming we can trust that diode. We haven't worked with the APU GFX diode before, but that's what it gave us. This was under a combined CPU plus GPU workload, so it's fine. It's not special, but it's okay. The initial load period is governed by the CPU EDC limit hitting 100%, which is directly replaced later by the APU STAPM limit, or the Skin Temperature Aware Power Management probe. This is a limit designed around laptops, so hitting 100% of this for the duration of test would end up backing down the frequency. This applies a hard 45 watt package power limit and none of the thermal throttling flags monitored by Hardware Info ever activated during this test. The only throttle flags that were activated were GPU power limits, and that went into effect when the STAPM limit hit 100%. This limit is useless for this kind of device. It is designed for laptops where you have, as the name would indicate, a skin temperature limitation if the laptop is literally on someone's lap, or if it's pushing any amount of heat into where the wrists might be on the keyboard. So here, it's just limiting us in a way that's not necessary. In our testing of various NUCs and IGPs earlier this year, we established a limited set of game tests suitable for lower-end hardware. The results on these charts apply to full systems, not individual components. So for example, we paired the 5700G with our standard CPU test bench hardware, including 3200 CL14 RAM, while the HX90 was tested with the included 3200 CL22 RAM. The chart subtitles will list the normal memory spec for the other parts, but obviously it's different for the HX90. We'll start off with Fortnite. At 1080p with DX11 low settings, the HX90 ran at 81 FPS average in our combat-free test area, enough performance headroom that firefights would mostly remain playable. However, we did experience some extreme hitches, generally when turning a corner and aiming the camera at a new model and texture, but they were infrequent enough that even the 0.1% lows averaged out to 37 FPS. 
This puts the HX90 just above the Phantom Canyon Nux 1165G7 on the chart, which is a somewhat disappointing start compared to the 5700G. That one averaged 102 FPS in this test, about a 27% uplift. The 5600G wasn't far behind at 94 FPS average, and so the HX90 is obviously not really that close to those. Switching to Fortnite's experimental performance mode next, we see the HX90's performance boost up to 131 FPS average, but the 5700G was 29% ahead at 169 FPS average, and the more cost-effective and lower power 5600G managed 155 FPS. The Rainbow Six Siege benchmark is a test borrowed from our CPU suite. We run it at 1080p with very high settings, which is a tall order for most of the IGPs we've tested thus far, despite being perhaps the least demanding CPU and GPU benchmark we run. The HX90 averaged 45 FPS with a 37 FPS 1% low, below what we'd consider playable for a fast-paced game. Dropping settings or render resolution would be a good idea here to support the frame rate. And the 5700G averaged 29% ahead at 58 FPS, and the 1165G7 pulled ahead as well at 50 FPS. Counter-Strike Global Offensive. We're moving back to playable settings with CSGO at 1080p medium, with the HX90 averaging 102 FPS in this test. The 5700G maintains approximately the same advantage, 25% in this instance, at 126 FPS average, while the 5600G averaged 119 FPS. The HX90 maintained an acceptable average of 67 FPS in Rocket League, but with poor frame time consistency, leading to a 16 FPS 0.1% low. The hitching here is problematic. In a game that's this competitive and requires such a high frame rate, you're going to feel that hitch. Most of the systems we've tested had some frame time issues, including the 5600G and 5700G with their a uh, tied and relatively high average frame rate of 83. So that's it for the HX90. <laughs> Just like we said earlier, at this point, the main reason to not buy it is because the company has demonstrated to us that uh, it's not to be trusted with liquid metal, and that's the key marketing point. So it's not even about how the company is behaving otherwise. It really just comes, it's product level. It sounds like it's maybe company ethos level or something, but it's really not. Our reason for not feeling comfortable getting behind this product in any way as a consumer, it comes down to a product level decision, which is the stuff we talked about earlier. Don't need to go through it again. If you skip that part, go watch the beginning because it's basically the conclusion. So there's some tests for you. If you do want to buy it, you've got numbers. Uh, the chassis seems okay for what it is, honestly. It's just the rest of this thing. The execution was extremely poor. The uh, Assembly is odd and at odds with the upgradable and serviceable marketing where they're using security screws as a tamper resistant screw that it just it doesn't make any sense. It seems like they picked something that other people used without really thinking about maybe why and what Minis Forum would want to do instead. So we're very confused by the company. The product is kind of okay if you can look past the major issues we talked about in the beginning of this video. Uh, it is, however, too expensive for the performance you get, and the motherboard is still ITX, like in, in size. So really, it, you could build this. It's a mini ITX PC. Other people make them. If you don't want to build it, you can buy one pre-built. That's totally fine. But it's a mini ITX PC with the power brick external so that it appears smaller than it is in reality. Uh, the only maybe upside there is that since the power brick is external, you can mount this to the back of a monitor. That's kind of cool. But you can do that with other boxes too. So this one is not one for us. That's sort of the short version of it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.